everybody, and welcome to Real Shame. It's a bi-weekly show where we talk about our list of shame or list of movie blind spots. They're movies that are popular or classic or everybody's seen them, but we haven't. So we're going to pick one each week and discuss it. I'm Andy. I'm Adam. And this week we're going to talk about... We're talking about Contagion, 2011's Contagion, directed by Steven Soderbergh. But before we get into that, um, let's talk about what we've been watching. So, Andy, what have you been watching? Well, due to uh, what's going, kind of going on right now, which obviously we will get into, a lot of us have been spending time at home, <laughs> and so I've had plenty of time to watch many different things. Over the weekend, I watched a few sequels. Two of them are sequels to movies that we have talked about recently. Have I they watched. Been, have we, did we publish those episodes yet? Uh. We will. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm we, just we, curious. We, just we, curious. We, we, yeah, we, yeah, they, yeah, they both will have been published <laughs> by, the, by the time that this go, goes out. So 300 uh, yeah. has a sequel, which I don't know how many people are aware of the sequel. I know 300 is very popular. Rise of an Empire? Rise of an Empire. Rise with, of, yeah. it, it has Lena Headey. She reprises her role. It's got the same guy that played Xerxes. It's got the same guy that played the Hunchback, F.E. Altes. And it's a prequel. It is a prequel. It is concurrent with, and it takes place after 300. So it's kind of unique in that way. The it actually takes place, or it's it it deals with two different battles that yeah. went on. One I think was before the Battle of Thermopylae, and then the Battle of Thermopylae kind of goes on, and then one occurs after the Battle of Thermopylae. It unlike 300, it mainly takes place on the ocean or on the sea, mm. and it I didn't like 300 as we know, but I, this one is. If you like 300, you'll like this. I, I wasn't crazy about this one either. Mm. I it didn't have quite the level of slow motion that 300 does, so I didn't get irked by that. <laughs> I thought it was it, it was entertaining. The the main guy, so Gerard Butler's not in it. I think yeah. he was in talks to reprise uh, at least maybe a cameo, but he didn't end up doing it. The guy who is the lead in it, Sullivan Stapleton, I believe is his name. I'm not really familiar with him. He does an okay job. He's not quite Gerard Butler level. But the standout in the film to me was Eva Green's villain. I thought she was really good in it. And I always thought from the trailers that Eva Green was taking Lita, Lita Hetty's role. So yeah, I didn't no, know she no. was a brand new character or that right. Lena Hetty reprised her role. I just always thought like, oh yeah, they just grabbed someone that was another brunette and replaced yeah. her. From no. the trailers, but I guess I was incorrect. She's basically Xer- Xerxes' right hand woman. Okay, in, cool. In the Very film. cool. But so, again, if you if you like three hundred, I know you like three hundred. You you might want to check it out. All right, man. I'll definitely will. Uh, I watched a sequel to Hollow Man. <laughs> I haven't I haven't seen this yet, but I'm very curious about this. Yeah, well, so this one has Christian Slater. I don't think there's any. Yeah, there's nobody from the original Hollow Man in this film. They were all past, and also it was direct to video or direct yeah. to DVD at that time. It's two thousand and six. It's not great again, but. For a direct-to-video or direct-to-DVD movie, you could do a lot worse. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. say that. I, I think it, it it's interesting in that Christian Slater is really the top build kind of guy for it. But just like the original Invisible Man with Claude Rains, you don't really see him until the end or towards mm-hmm. the climax. There is one scene in the movie where it flashes back to where he's getting this treatment that makes him invisible. But it only lasts like a couple of minutes. And so, so you really don't see him until the end. So he's not the love child of Kevin Bacon and he, Rona Mitra? <laughs> no, it, the, oh, only, the, only, <laughs> the only real connection that it has to the original Hollow Man is that they briefly kind of talk about, oh, well, a few years ago oh, yeah. they were doing this research and the guy went crazy and he killed all these people. We continued his research. So that's really the only connection that it has. Because that's what you do. When yeah, the lab yeah. blows up, <laughs> guy goes crazy. You know all that yeah. kind of stuff. You want to you want you want to continue that. Research. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's sweep it under the rug and, and continue working. But um, so it, I, I will say one of the more interesting things about the movie is you do see a fight between two invisible men, and I know what you're thinking. You're like, how does that work? You can't see anything. But it's at this point in the movie, Christian Slater has put on clothes, kind of like the Invisible Man from 1933. So you just see he's like put on the goggles, shirts, and, oh. Yeah, well, yeah. well, he's put on the goggles and like a ski mask looking thing and some clothes, so you can see him. The other guy's completely invisible, but they're both kind of duking it out. Interesting. Yeah, and then it doesn't seem completely well. Uh, it doesn't seem completely well thought out. It seems half baked. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I, I found it kind of interesting. It, it may be the best part of the movie, and then and then Christian Slater says, "Oh, well, I'm at a disadvantage because this other Invisible yeah, yeah. Man can." see me so he strips and they both go fight in the rain so then you could tell them apart in the rain so yeah 
how convenient it started raining whenever they <laughs> whenever they started fighting. All right, moving on. I, I won't too much, uh, touch too much on the, the next two movies. Mortal Engines. You remember that one? It came out. I do remember that movie. It's based off a um, a teen graphic or not teen graphic novel, a teen novel, like kind of like yeah. a Hunger Games kind of stuff. Right. Um, I remember it not getting very good reviews. Yeah, and it, again, it's not great. I didn't hate it. Um, it has Hugh, Hugo Weaving is kind of the the main villain yeah. in it. The rest of the cast I was largely unfamiliar with. Apparently. I think one they're of the, all Austra- I think a lot of them are Australian. I, mean, I don't know why I said that. One of the lead girls in it is the daughter of Vincent D'Onofrio. Okay. So, you know, she has Hollywood in her blood, but I, I'm not really familiar with her either. It was okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm, you know, just one of those things. And then finally, I watched a few other things, but we, we can skip over that. I, I did watch another movie. So we watched Contagion, which we're going to yeah. talk about. We watched Outbreak, which we'll talk about in the next episode. I watched another kind of virus film from the 80s called Warning Sign, oh, yeah. which is kind of just, it, it's pretty much a B movie, although it's got a lot of well-known cast in it or people that you've seen before. You may not know them by name. Um, it I saw it a few years ago, actually, and then I rewatched it here within the last few days. It's a decent B movie, although it kind of winds up being more of a, the virus in this film turns them into zombies, which gotcha. I had forgotten about, honestly. So it's it's not exactly in line with Outbreak yeah, and Contagion, yeah. but it's still another virus film. It is streaming if yep. if you want to check it out. It's another it's another one. Another what was the name of that you. one again? It's called Warning Sign. Warning Sign. Gotcha. Yeah. So what have you been watching? So it's interesting that you said that you have this lot of time to watch things because I feel like I haven't had a lot of time to watch <laughs> things. Um, I've just been, you know, I'm just, I'm still trying to find a really good series on Netflix to kind of get into and get wrapped up in. Um, I started the second season of Altered Carbon. Have you, did you ever watch any of the Altered Carbons? Not yet. So it's based off a novel, and the first season was really good, and it had, um, I can't think of the actor's name. He was the guy who played the Robocop in the reboot of Robocop, and he was in... I um, can't think of his name either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, really good actor and I really liked the first season so I don't know why I was hesitant to kind of watch the second season and kind of the premise of the show is that your consciousness kind of lays in this disc and you can be in a different body so they call different body sleeves so your body can so your consciousness will live in this disc but you can be in different sleeves so each season they have a different actor playing the main character oh interesting so in the first season they had that actor who I can't think. And he's also in The Killing. He was really good in The Killing. I think that's kind of what broke him out in the U.S. And then this season, you have Anthony Mackie, uh, um, Falcon. Gotcha. Oh, not Falcon. Is it Falcon? Yeah, Anthony Mackie's Falcon. Yeah, yeah. Falcon. And and maybe soon to be Captain America. And, right? and Captain America. Shield, yeah. So you So it's really good so far. I'm about halfway through, I think, the season of it. And uh, it's, you know, the quality is great. You know, a lot of these kind of Netflix movies, shows and stuff. You know, the quality is really good, and you can tell the, the writing is really good. So I'm really enjoying that. I haven't quite finished it, but, you know, was, I'm glad I finally decided to jump down and start watching the second season. I'm very, very far behind on all my Amazon shows. I've, I've <laughs> oh, watched Netflix. Almost, or, uh, Netflix. I've watched almost none of uh, Black Mirror and things like that. I've, i got to catch up. And we're trying to get, I'm, we've been trying to get you to watch Black Mirror for a while. Yeah. And I'm I think, not, I'm not against it. I just, and I, I like, and I what we said for the Sin City review is that I want us to rewatch Watchmen or watch the Watchmen, watch Watchmen. HBO series. Watch Watchmen. Yes. Watch Watchmen. Yes. Um, with that, you know, I also started The Kingdom with Kirby, and uh, it's a Korean zombie movie that takes place in like feudal imperial Korea, and it's very cool, very interesting the way they do. Z- then the the most interesting thing is like I know with. Japanese movies, the way they do vampires are different than our vampires. Like they have the hopping vampires, right? They just jump up and down. It's one of those <laughs> weird, it's either Japanese or Chinese. I'm pretty sure it's Japanese. Yeah. It's just one of those weird cultural things where, you know, the, the, their history with, you know, the undead is different than our history with the undead. But the, um, the kingdom, their zombies act a lot like we know in the Western world, like how zombies are and stuff. So it's just kind of, it's an interesting setting to place a um, zombie kind of TV show or movie, even though I feel zombies are kind of played out. Yeah, oh, definitely. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they just dropped the new season of that, so we'll get through all those. And then the last thing I kind of want to call out is, and this is something we kind of talked about, is 
I find myself watching more and more YouTube these days versus, you know, your HBOs, your Netflixes, and your Amazons. Yeah. And I found this YouTube channel that I thought was really good, and I just want to call them out. It's called Sideways. And basically, this guy um, who runs this channel analyzes scores of movies. And it's very interesting just kind of him talking about scores. And, like, he has, you know, um, he has videos that are, like, you know, what makes a score heroic and all that kind of stuff. And he has a bunch of videos, which is how I kind of found his channel, where he's digging into, like, the Disney, you know, how they use Broadway musicals for the resurgence in the 90s of all their cartoons. And then, you know, um, analyzing, like, why Tarzan doesn't work as a musical and all that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to call out his channel. I think it's really cool. I'm really enjoying all those videos. Sweet. And I'm spending, you know, a lot of time watching those <laughs> instead of watching movies for this, like I oh, should. Well. No. As long, as long as you watch the movies that we're actually going to talk about, <laughs> yeah. it's all good, right? It doesn't matter. <laughs> so that is what I've been watching. So next we're going to jump into Contagion. Before that, before we do that, we kind of want to talk about the reason why we're, we're going to talk about it. And we're not trying to monopolize on what's going on in the world today. It's just that, you know, we've seen, um, you know, movies like Contagion and Outbreak have been spiking in the rental charts lately. Most definitely. And, uh, you know, I thought everyone has seen Outbreak and Contagion, but it turns out... Not this guy. Yeah. So we're going to... We're taking this as an opportunity since a lot of people are viewing these movies to kind of do it ourselves and view them. So that's kind of the reason why we're talking about it. And, you know, just, you know, everyone out there, stay safe and pay attention to what the health officials say, do what they say, and we're going to be just doing the same thing, so... All right, with that, let's talk about contagion. Let's do it. We've modeled the way it enters the cells of the lung and the brain, and the virus contains both bat and pig sequences. In the bottom right, you can see the dark green is pig and the light green is bat, and here you can see the crossover event, uh, bat, bat, and pig, bat. And here is a model of the virus and how it attaches to its host. Uh, the blue is virus and the gold is human and the red is the viral attachment protein and the green is its receptor in the human cells. These receptors are found in the cells of both uh, the respiratory tract and the central nervous system. And the virus attaches to the cell like a key slipping into a lock. Somewhere in the world, the wrong pig met up with the wrong bat. You ever seen anything like this before? No. And it Contagion's a movie that came out in 2011 and it's directed by Steven Soderbergh and it's written by Sean Burns. This is the second movie they did together, um, the first one being Informant with also with Matt Damon. Matt Damon, right. And I feel like this movie, uh, <laughs> I feel like after like the 2000s and 8s, uh, Steven Soderbergh announces his retirement like after every movie he does he's do you remember that I, I, yeah no, i i forgot yeah. but now that you say that i yeah i do remember now he's, he, he does do that yeah, yeah he's like oh, this is my last movie and yeah. then next thing you hear like six months later it's like oh i filmed this movie now that, that, that was my last movie. yeah <laughs> no, that's that, my yeah. last movie right you know so i, I, I think that. it's really interesting that he um that that's just kind of what i think of him whenever i see a new movie come out because he did like the nick afterwards he did like a bunch of like really big series of movies <laughs> even though well, he like retired it, and I, I do remember again now that you know that you're saying that although i'd forgotten that he has announced that a few times what has he said what is his reasoning for doing that every time I mean, like what's like quentin tarantino always says he's gonna do 10 I mean, I'm, yeah i'm gonna do 10 movies or whatever and then i'm out of the game and uh, okay i mean he's had a pretty great career yeah. his movies are very very acclaimed and commercially uh well done or commercially successful excuse me uh, but Steven Soderbergh, what's what is his reason? Do you know? Like I don't remember it? reading. Like, eh, I'm just tired yeah, or something. Yeah, maybe. So. And the other thing that I like about Steven Soderbergh is that he keeps a very extensive list, like almost a daily. I think it is a daily diary of all the kind of media he consumes. So he like writes down whether he watched a movie, whether he read a novel, wrote, whether he read a play, oh. and all that kind of stuff. And like he publishes them every year, so you can find these like extensive lists of like basically how he spent his whole year in consuming media, which is something I've tried and I can only keep up for about a week. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was going to say, I, I try and because since we started doing this show, I try and write down all the movies that I've watched, yeah. not only so that we can talk about them at the beginning of the show, but also just to kind of have a log. And I still forget to do that. So yeah, I, I props to him for being able to do that. 
So um, Contagion has an all-star cast. You know, you have Matt Damon, you have Kate Winslet, you have Marianne Cotillard, Lawrence Fishburne, a whole bunch of, of you know, Jude Law, a bunch of, you know, really well-known A-cast characters. Yep. The movie is a little bit different than what you would think of as a standard way of telling the story because it kind of follows a whole bunch of these little vignettes, these little um, shorts inside of a larger picture, right? And that's something that's akin to like movies like Short, was it Shortcuts? It's kind of like that. Yeah, and, Robert Altman, right. And, you know, of that kind of ilk. Mm-hmm. So um, you haven't seen this movie before. Right. What were your thoughts on Contagion? Uh, <laughs> oh no, that doesn't sound. No, 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 no. That no, no that's, that's not, it, it, the reason I the reason I exhaled like that is because for me it's a movie that I, I don't want to say it defies criticism, but it's so clinical. No, no pun intended. Yeah. It's so clinical. It's so almost detached and austere. And and it, he's trying to tell a story about hey. In a very realistic, yeah. trying try to make it as realistically uh, re- realistic as possible and scientifically accurate and all those things. So a movie like this, you don't necessarily watch it to be entertained, right? You don't, I, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to be entertained by a film like this, this, just like it's hard to be entertained by a movie. Uh, one movie that came to mind when I was watching this was, and this it's another almost disaster type film, but because it's because of a nuclear war, it's a movie called Failsafe from the 1960s. Also has an all-star cast with Henry Fonda and people like that. But a movie like that, you watch it, it's good, it's gripping. But at the end, you're just kind of drained by it. And it's it's hard to say. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I had some some good things about Contagion that I liked and some things about it that I was like, oh, they could have done this or they could have yeah. done that or whatever. But it's it's so hard for me to say... Ooh, I liked it, you know, or or I disliked it because it's just it's so matter of fact and it's so I mean, yes, he's telling a story, but it's so hard for me to be like, oh yeah, thumbs up or thumbs down. Oh, yeah. I, I would say overall, I enjoyed it if if the, if, if if I could say I enjoyed a film like this because it's very horrifying, right? Uh, when this came out in two thousand eleven, I didn't see it. A lot of my friends saw it. And they said, oh, I went and saw Contagion, and I was so terrified. I was so terrified. <laughs> and I didn't really look into what the film was about. I mean, obviously, from a title like Contagion, I kind yeah, of yeah. could guess, right? But I thought it was more of a horror film, like like a zombie movie or like a, you know, like would have jump scares and stuff like that. And so when we were talking about watching Contagion, of course, I was like, oh, wait, it's not a horror movie at all. It's, you know, it's Steven Soderbergh, who I don't think has ever really done a horror film. But if you describe this as a horror film, I don't think you're that far off, right? Because yeah. it's very, it's a very scary and gripping film about, oh, this is something that could happen. So I would say I liked it overall, but at the same time, I just felt like, ugh, <laughs> you know, when it when, when it was over, because it's, it's difficult to watch a movie where something like this happens, right? Yeah. So That's interesting because I thought it was a really entertaining movie and like, for me, like getting that kind of anxiety in that movie where you're at the edge of your seat, like Contagion wasn't that kind of movie for me. Yeah. But for movies like Gravity or Green Room are those kind of movies for me where I feel like, you know, I'm being uh, like, I, not strangled, but, you know, just feel like I can't catch my breath and I'm on the edge of my seat. But yeah. for this, you know, I am able to kind of, you know, lean back and enjoy the movie and just enjoy it as entertainment, I guess. I, I, mean, I guess that's just our different ways of kind of... Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I had anxiety while I was watching this, but at the same time, just seeing the things that are unfolding. Yeah. And and again, probably a lot of it has to do with just thinking about, you know, everything that's going on right now. Although, again, the virus in this film is much more severe. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it doesn't really have a, a target demographic. It kills, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow's character. It kills their son. It kills yeah. all these different people. So it's 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 definitely kind of amped up. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I still, again, I was, I, I liked the film, mm-hmm. uh, aside from a few things, which, which I'll get into, but at the end, I was just kind of left, I don't know, <laughs> it's, yeah. hard to, it's hard to explain, left cold maybe, but maybe that's because of the coldness of the film, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, and I want to jump back on what you say, because I do think he kind of shot it in a very clinical way, because the, the color temperature of the, the movie is very yellow. I feel like even like the box art has a little bunch of yellow in it, but yeah, I yeah, feel like he does. shot a lot with natural light. And that reminds me a lot of, um, Oh, 
I was gonna say the director's name now. He's left me. He's the guy who did the Tom Cruise and the Jamie Lee, Jamie Lee Fox movie. Um, oh, Michael Mann. Yeah. Michael Mann. Oh, collateral. Yeah, Collateral yeah. and stuff like that. So I feel like they're both kind of using natural light, and a lot of it kind of reminded me of the way Michael Mann shot that movie. I feel like Soderbergh does that a lot in his yeah. movies. You, you, would, would you say that's a fair assessment? I, do. I I felt like Traffic looked like that. And obviously, this movie also reminded me of Traffic. I, I actually yeah. wrote that down in my notes. Because it he has these different threads. <laughs> well, it has these different threads that has all these disparate stories yeah. that some intersect, some don't. But they, they tend to all have an effect on one another. So Same I have kind of not thing. seen Traffic. I would say Traffic is a, a better film. Yeah. If, if I, I mean, it's hard to compare the two, probably. But I would say I enjoy Traffic more but i'd okay. say you know the other thing that's really interesting is that he directed the oceans movies yeah which are stylistically different from this movie and from a lot of the things he did because he kind of yes. broke out in the scene with sex lies and videotape great movie yes was um the first mainstream movie he did i don't know yeah. if that's the first movie he did yeah it, it was uh and, and it was a huge hit in the festival circuit and whatnot it was it came out of nowhere and everybody was like oh this is a guy to watch and, and I think I was working at the movie theater when that movie came out uh, back in the day because I remember like it having like a, a theater or two dedicated to it and, stuff, yeah. and hearing a lot about it, but I never watched it either. It's a great, well, we'll have to add it to your list. It's a great movie. Yeah, after he did Sex, Lies, and Videotape, he did, and I'd forgotten about I, I was going back and looking at his filmography. He did Kafka with Jeremy Irons, which I saw a long time ago. <laughs> Don't remember anything about it, but I do remember it kind of being very weird. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's Franz Kafka, so I guess it, it should be weird. And then he did a film starring himself called Schizopolis, which I've never seen. Mm -hmm. He did a movie called The Underneath with Peter Gallagher, which was filmed in Austin, which is kind of like a film noir movie, which I seem to remember as being pretty good when I watched it back then. And then he kind of started doing the Oceans movies. But yeah, the Oceans movies, it's like night and day, right? Yeah, compared to completely. movies like Contagion and all the you haven't seen Traffic compared to movies like Traffic. And it makes sense because of the kind of movies they are, but it's just, it's interesting yeah. like seeing those two different things. And then you'd go on to direct like Magic Mike. Magic Mike, <laughs> yeah, jerk. I'd forgotten that he did that. Of course, I, I have not seen, not had the pleasure of seeing Magic Mike yet, but I'll get around to it. <laughs> so maybe. even so, even though this movie doesn't have like a main character in it, I thought it did pretty well with balancing the story between everyone. I won't. Say, I agree. I wouldn't say like. I mean, I feel like maybe Matt Damon might be more central to it, but I feel like he, probably screen time wise, he doesn't get a lot of screen time. I think the only negative i would say about the storylines is i feel like marianne cotillard's storyline was very abrupt and like you would see her you know you see her get kidnapped spoilers for the movie you see her get kidnapped right and then the, i'm pretty sure the next scene you see her in she's teaching a school for the kids and it's like okay like what happened during that time like what you know would she and then at the end you know she's helping her kidnappers so it's yeah. like, is that Stockholm Syndrome or what? But I feel like that could have used a little bit more intercutting or a little bit more scenes to kind of understand the arc of her character. You know? I agree 110%. I felt the exact same thing whenever I was watching this. They, he does do a good job of balancing the threads, and I found it interesting. Obviously, you know, a lot of the, these big-time actors and actresses are in the film very little, yep. or they get killed off pretty early. Like Gwyneth Paltrow's character is Patient Zero. Yeah. She's dead within and the Kate, first 10, 15 Kate minutes. Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet. Which I thought was an awesome surprise. Like, I didn't yes. expect that. I didn't either. I thought that was a good, like, uh, hook or a good curveball to throw at us. Right. But, yes, I thought the Marion Cotillard story was kind of bizarre, first of all. Yeah. And... I was wondering towards the end of the film if they were ever going to get back to it. And then yeah. they finally did go back and she gets released. And like you said, she's at the airport and he's like, oh, we gave them placebos. Sure and she's like, that. whoop, I got to go help them or whatever. I, I mean, I think by that point, because presumably she'd been there for a few months or a year yeah. or whatever. I think by that point she had obviously grown to really like them, the children and, and whatnot. So it makes sense that she would want to go help them because they take the placebo and then they go, oh, we're cured. And then they go out or yeah. we have a vaccine. Then they go out and get infected. She would feel terrible. But yes, that did feel very abrupt to me. And I, and again, I was wondering like what happened to the Marion yeah. Cotillard character? And I thought it would have been better served if she was, if it was like part of a cover up, right? Because the reason why she goes to that village you know, because she's like, it started here in this village, right? And they're trying to figure it out. And I thought it would have been more interesting if, you know, she kind of got offed because it was some kind of government government cover up. Yeah, probably I thought that was what was going to happen. Yeah, 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 probably not what Scott and uh, Scott Burns and Stephen were going for. But I thought that would have been more interesting. I do think it's interesting that you know, you do at the end have Matt Damon kind of going through that camera 
and figuring out, you know, teaching the audience basically how the whole thing started. And that kind of stays with him a little bit and not yeah. like it gets published and all that kind of stuff. So I think that was a interesting choice. Right. Like interesting and good, not interesting and like bad. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> again, I think maybe we talked about this when we were talking about kicking and screaming. I always love to see Elliot Gould. So yeah. he, he's not in the film very much at all, but he is instrumental in growing the virus, although yeah. he goes against the CDC's yeah, he does, wishes he does, he does. in doing so. And then I, I did like the the flaws that people I, I call them flaws, but they're just human nature. Yeah. I did like the aspect he's determined to help in, in figuring out what's going on with this virus. So he grows it, even though the CDC tells him not to. And like Lord Lawrence Fishburne, Fishburne yep. warns his fiance, yep. to, he, and, and he gets in trouble for it. Right? He's going to have a hearing, and they're going to investigate yep. that he did that. He leaked that information but, and I, before, but the, but who wouldn't do that, right? Exactly. I mean, and right. but I'm a little confused on the ending of his thing because he gives his injection to the to um the kid right the because they have the janitor and then he, you know he has this kid that has add and right. he gives the you know I, I think it's a show of compassion right because you know obviously you know that kid will have to wait for the lottery and lawrence fishburne since he's part of the cdc we you know got bumped up higher on the list or is on a different list altogether right so i like that show of compassion but at the end i was like so is he gonna get it or is he not gonna get it like what's going on yeah because he gives it to his wife and he gives it to the kid but like what is the outcome for him because he puts the band on his wrist too so i'm yeah i'm a little lost i don't know uh, yeah, I, I, I honestly I didn't even, I didn't even really think about that. I just I I, I, kind, of, I kind of glossed over that yeah. point. Uh, but speaking of Lawrence Fishburne, he's always great. I think yes. he's great as this CDC official. I thought Kate. I, I mean, I wouldn't say anybody in the film uh, did a poor job or anything like that, or I felt like was miscast. Matt Damon is kind of the everyman character. Uh, I mean, honestly, he does spend a lot of the film looking kind of bewildered. <laughs> but I would too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I was in that situation, especially. I mean, he has this, you know, he, fortunately he's immune to it, yeah. but he has to watch two of his loved ones die, two of his, you know, his wife yeah. and his his, his child die. Yeah. Uh, so obviously it's very devastating to him. But for me, the standout performance of the film is Jennifer Ellie, I -E -H -L -E, I don't know how to pronounce her name. She is the one that actually comes up with the vaccine and inoculates herself. I loved her character. I thought she was fantastic in this. I really did. Yeah, I, you know, she didn't stand out to me as anything, like anything above the rest of the actors. I'm with you. I think everyone is doing a very good above average job. Like everyone's just firing on all cylinders. Yeah. So for me, her character didn't really stand out. The one thing that did stand out to me was her injecting herself with the needle and she's wearing like a mini skirt, which to me just <laughs> seems like, like I don't think she'd be wearing a mini skirt in the lab. And I did look it up, and apparently that's an insert shot because initially when they filmed it, she stuck it through clothing, mm. and that that and then you know that was that's not realistic. Yeah, I don't know how much a mini skirt is for realist for realism, right. but that's the reason why it has it. But that that kind of stood out to me like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I didn't I didn't even notice that. And then it brought more questions because like, is it a vaccine? So like, how how sick do people have to be before they can get it? Because she went to go see her dad which I thought was very touching, but it's like, you know, hey, maybe you can, what happens if you give it to him? Maybe it could help, but none of these were answered. <laughs> so that kind of just brought back all these questions for me when I was watching it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, yeah, if she, if she gives him the vaccine at the stage that he was in, I don't yeah. think it would have done anything. But I, I like that character a lot. I loved her kind of, she was no nonsense. She told it like it was. Uh, she she had there was humor about her, but in a very dry way. Yeah. I, I per particularly or one one thing that I remember that that stood out to me. I love when she's talking to Lawrence Fishburne on the phone, and he's like, "Oh well, uh, you know, they want to know how fast we can get a vaccine, how fast we can do this." Da -da. And she's like, "You know, it's going to be a long time, I and mean, we're going to have trials, and we, you know, it, it, it's going to be this time frame." Well, also they're asking me if we can do treat it like fluoride and yeah. put it in the water, yeah, something yeah. like that. And she's just like, yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> you know, just kind of is like yeah. end of call. I mean, like that, yeah. like as if to say without saying it, that absolutely not. That's a yeah. ridiculous yeah. idea. We can't do this without testing it. Of course, then she is the test subject herself, like Jonas Salk, injecting herself with the vaccine. But no, I, I really, really dug her character a lot. And I, I'm sure I've probably seen her in some other things, but she's not a super well-known actress to me anyways. Yeah. Uh, but I really, really liked her. And just based on the strength of this performance, I'd like to check out some more of her uh, filmography. Sure. I really liked her. So. And we talked a little bit about Jude Law. And I like I like Jude Law's character. I like that he's 
you kind of don't get a definitive answer on whether or not he's purposely misleading people and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you kind of have it in the room when he's with Veronica Mars's dad. Um, I don't know the actor's name. I just know him from Big yeah, Veronica Mars. I, I, I know who you're talking about, yeah. Uh, you know, Detective Mars or P.I. Mars. Uh, and he kind of says that basically, you know, hey, we tested you, you didn't do it. But he kind of has that look where he's like, this could be a government conspiracy for that stuff. I, 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 I mean, I got the sense yeah. that he was very deliberately trying I did to too. profit off of, yeah. Of and then the next scene, he's bit. out there with like the little camera, like interviewing people online yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Because he got, he made bail. I, I, I liked, I liked having that kind of, um, counter storyline with all that that's just you know someone who's purposefully you know misleading everyone and stuff like that where you have all these altruistic people you know and then you have matt damon the avery man kind of get cut up in it but overall their goal is to kind of you know get by this and get through this and his goal is to make as much money as he can so i kind of liked all that one thing i i said i was going to mention this <laughs> and i'm about to since we're on the topic of jude law is his teeth in this film yeah. When I was watching it, I was like, "What? what's going on with Jude Law's teeth? Because they don't look like Jude Law's teeth from all the other movies that I've seen Jude Law in. And apparently it was a, a deliberate choice for him to wear some sort of prosthetic yep. that made his teeth look like some sort of shady blogger. I, I don't know, but I, I thought that was weird. I just I had to point that out because it was a little distracting. Because Jude Law's a handsome guy, right? Yeah. I mean, we saw him in the rhythm section, although that was not a good yeah, film. No. We, we just saw him recently at, at the theater and... and I was like, you know, Jude Law's teeth don't normally look like that. So what's going on here? So I was like, is he, is do his teeth normally look like that? And he wears a prosthetic in other films, or do they have him wear a prosthetic for this film? And apparently it's the latter. So just had to point that he out. He borrowed Rami Malek's teeth <laughs> to film this movie. Oh, oh. Whoa, yeah, no. Uh, but that's all I really have to say about Contagion. I mean, I don't know if you have anything else to say. I overall thought it was a really well done movie. I'm really surprised on how much I like this movie considering that it doesn't follow standard um, narrative structure. And that's the kind of stuff that I usually like, you know, the hero's journey kind of na standard narrative structure or movies that really, you know, um, click with me really well. So I was really surprised that I liked it, even its narrative structure. And like you said, I thought all the actors were doing a great job. Yeah. I was like, check out traffic. I, I do think traffic is a little, traffic is about two and a half hours long. Mm -hmm. This movie clocks in under two hours. Contagion does. And so I feel like traffic, just based on sheer length alone, has a little bit more development to it. So uh, it has a lot of threads, just like this movie, but they're developed more. You don't have instances like in Contagion, where we talked about Marion Cotillard's thread yeah. kind of gets short shrift. So I, I, I don't feel like you have that in traffic, so you might want to check that out or, or when we put it on yeah, your list or we'll whatever. put it on and, the list. And, and Maybe do there. that with shortcuts or sex lies and videotape yep. or something. Yep. Sounds good to me. But yeah, that's, that's all I've got for Contagion. All right, guys, thank you for tuning into the show. Um, you know, follow us on Instagram, Real Shame. Shoot us an email, realshame at gmail.com. And uh, we'll see you next time when we're talking about Outbreak from 1995. Outbreak with uh, the monkey from Friends, <laughs> starring the monkey from Friends. So, yes. Mar Marcel? <laughs> Marcel. Okay. So, uh, tune in for that, and uh, we'll be talking about that. Thank you for your time, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye.